All right, uh, so welcome everyone to this um, talk. So this is a lecture I gave for the School Scientist of the Year Award in uh, like 2022, so that was a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, and I'm simply going to record it again uh, so that it can be shared uh, more uh, widely. So um, the, the, the title of, of the talk has to do with are we close to the end of physics? And of course, there are many uh, you know, uh, angles this can be tackled uh, with. Um, so first of all, you may want to ask, but why would I query about this? Well, this question has been asked for uh, at least uh, you know, one century, let's say, or, or a century and a half. Um, and it's always this idea that somebody is going to claim that you know, we are almost there, and then basically you know, the job of physicist is going to be done. Uh, it's just some kind of details to tweak, and then we, we, we're done. So what is this narrative that we've got today? Um, so here I'll just give an example from, the, from this uh, issue of the New Scientist um, in 2016. And what you see here is like this big title, which is the sixth biggest problem in physics. Um, and so you're going to see uh, dark matter, dark energy. So dark matter, dark energy, infl inflation, then force unification, fine tuning. And there is a, a kind of outlier, which is measurement. Um, and so this has to do with the measurement problem in, in quantum mechanics and so on. Uh, and it's kind of an outlier. But what you see here is that out of six apparently biggest problems in physics, uh, essentially five of them have to do with cosmology and uh, basically particle physics. And, and that's it. Now, when you look at, at the kind of things that, that these things uh, are going to relate to, uh, it basically boils down to this particular, for example, diagram. So this is something that you could find on, uh, you know, when you type theory of everything um, on Wikipedia, for example. Um, and so the, the idea here is that there is a kind of theory of everything which is going to capture every question, if you will, that, that we have uh, about the universe and uh, be it uh, if we want to know how particles interact or how uh, basically the universe came to be and so on and so forth. So in this particular picture, it's actually hierarchical, as you can see, it's some kind of tree structure. And the way you could see it is basically you've got a, a set of uh, theories or ideas uh, which are basically considered uh, settled science. So at the very bottom, you would have this electricity and magnetism uh, topics. Then you've got some fanc more fanciful way of presenting electromagnetism as being basically a trivial young Mills theory and so on and so forth. And then you've got on top of this, you've got uh, things that, le that are left to be done. So uh, basically getting... Uh, or finding some kind of electronuclear force that is going to unify every interaction of particle physics. Um, and this is sometimes called GUT for ground unified theory. Then there is this uh, problem of uh, finding a consistent or coherent theory of quantum gravity. And finally, you would have this kind of growl of physics, as some people would like to call it, which is a theory of everything, and then you're kind of done. So uh, the point here uh, that I would like to take issue with, so of course many people could take issue with this particular picture of physics or what remains to be done in physics, um, which is often communicated in that way, uh, notably by, for example, uh, physicists in these fields. Um, so for example, Stephen Hawking, there is actually the name of a book which is called The Theory of Everything. Then Steven Weinberg, Dreams of a Final Theory, and you can also find in Brian Greene as well with the Elegant Universe, and he's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, and he's obviously a well-known advocate of string theory as a candidate for, uh, if you will, at least a part of a theory of everything. Uh, but on top of this, um, you know, all of this, you know, are communicated about by different... Um, you know, uh, popularization magazines and, and so on. And I think all of these um, um, headlines have been taken from uh, from New Scientist, as far as I can remember. Um, and as you see over uh, basically multiple uh, uh, decades, 
and um, and they are all about a uh, theory of everything. And in in fact, when when I speak to students, prospective students, and students who 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 learn with me in physics, for example, and so on, they actually think. Uh, that basically that's the only things that remain to be done uh, in physics and that's basically what physics uh, is about. Um, and, uh, and obviously that, that's posing a kind of problem in terms of uh, the uh, understanding of what kind of what physics is about and what remains to be done. So of course many people could get uh, um, let's say a, a critical view of this and then attack this particular viewpoint um, on different grounds. So, for example, like the many other things that are actually very, very unclear in physics, uh, and although it does not require uh, necessarily to go at super high energy, it doesn't mean that we actually understand something, uh, or it doesn't mean that we uh, don't require maybe additional laws to explain these things, okay? Um, I would like to remind people that uh, the... Uh, that quant quantum theory came about when people looked at the light emitted by uh, basically incandescent material. Okay, um, so there was nothing uh, you know high energy about it, uh, if you will. So um, so that's one angle that could be taken is basically looking at the whole uh, plethora of of topics in physics, which actually we don't understand which would require maybe actually additional fundamental laws um, and so on and so forth. Now, what I'm going to do instead is basically query wh whether this particular picture is, uh, is actually uh, faithful to how science uh, develops um, and how uh, basically people kind of communicate within scientific circles and... Um, uh, and that's it. So what I'm going to discuss is basically two questions about this particular picture of science and of fundamental physics in particular. So first of all, who decides uh, what is settled science? Um, and second of all, is there unexplored or untold fundamental issues in this set, uh, settled science? So uh, to do this, um, what I'm going to do here is basically provide... Um, some examples of issues in the um, alleged or purported uh, methodology uh, of science. Um, then I'm going to uh, provoke, provo no, propose, uh, maybe a provocative thing, but uh, propose uh, an example from physics teaching that actually illustrate one of these issues in the methodology of science. Um, and then I will provide as well a sample issue in electrodynamics. So this is an alleged uh, settled uh, science, uh, but we'll see that they are, uh, it is not devoid uh, of problems, uh, nevertheless. So uh, let's move on then. Uh, so issues in the methodology of science. Well, so here I would like to start with the what I'm going to call the unreliable effectiveness of consensus. Um, now, of course, uh, some of you may notice that this is a kind of uh, a joke, if you will, on uh, on Wigner's uh, uh, phrase on the um, on the surprising effectiveness of, of mathematics or something along these lines, um, and so here I would like to call that the unreliable effectiveness um, of consensus um, and unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, and I think here it's unreliable effectiveness of consensus. So why do I say that? Well. Let's let's settle for a definition uh, of consensus. So uh, here I'm going to define consensus as being a collective agreement on a given subject or question by experts uh, in the field. Okay. Um, now the thing that happens with uh, this with this definition um, is that once you have an impression uh, of consensus emerging about a particular question in the field. Um, or basically people claiming there is one, then in, pr in principle the way the social structure of scientific circles is made is such that this um, alleged consensus is going to influence uh, research funding and education. And these two things are basically like the main two pillars uh, which are going to uh, essentially feed into uh, the new trainees and the next generation of experts uh, and essentially, in doing so, 
uh, this next generation of experts is going to be more inclined uh, to be in favor of the consensus because again they have been taught for example through education this consensus uh, or uh, basically there is much more funding into this consensus and so they may believe this is the only thing actually that, that, that this is the only option uh, that is uh, worth investigating um, and so you see that there is this self um, reinforcing uh, character uh, in the notion of consensus um, and so it can be problematic to rely too much uh, on it now it, it could f uh, you know w what I'm saying could feel really uh, incredibly uh, kind of conspirationist or something like this but actually this comes from the logical structure of how uh, the, like the social structure of science, of science if you will and how it is practiced um, and then basically the definition of consensus itself now, I'm not the first one, obviously, to note this. Um, uh, for example, this was noted uh, in, uh, by Max Planck, the so Nobel Prize winner in physics. Um, in, uh, in his scientific autobiography, he would say, a scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents but, and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Um, and basically, that's kind of what I, I'm talking about here, is that essentially it doesn't matter whether people are uh, essentially, you know, uh, against uh, a particular idea or something. If somehow these ideas uh, do not go through, the, you know, they are, they are not, uh, you know, they are not taught, essentially, to the next generation, uh, and they are not entering anymore into research funding, then th th these ideas are going to die, essentially. Um, so that's uh, one thing. Now, the second thing in the methodology of science has to do with the hypothetical deductive model of the scientific method. So that's kind of a mouthful, but that's roughly what people have in mind when they talk about a scientific method of some kind. Um, here again, I'm going to uh, phrase it into three steps, uh, but of course there is disagreement anyway on what would this method would, would really comprise. But let, let, let's, let's entertain the idea that this particular method is as follows. Uh, first, you formulate a hypothesis about some phenomenon. Then you deduce a prediction following from the underlying hypothesis. Um, and then you experimentally test the said prediction. Uh, and you basically refute uh, the hypothesis if the prediction is not satisfied. Okay, So if you have a hypothesis, something should follow from this hypothesis. If this something is not true, then you can basically reject this particular uh, hypothesis. So that's how this is basically often communicated. So there is a uh, multiple problem with this view. Uh, the first one um, is that in practice, step two uh, is probabilistic. So what that means is that you, you could get maybe a genuine conclusion, uh, a dedicated, you know, determine an exact conclusion or prediction from an hypothesis yes you can but then if you when it comes to comparing to um, actual experimental data then it, it has to be uh, or become uh, probabilistic so the the claim has to become uh, probabilistic and that's where the infamous uh, or famous uh, term called p-values actually comes in i'm not going to talk about what, what these p-values are but as some of you may, may have heard in different uh, news outlets, read in news outlets or in, on TV and so on, these p-values have been talked a lot uh, about uh, uh, in the past few years when people were communicating about medical research. Um, and so here I just want to, to provide two issues with using p-values, for example, to uh, implement step three. Um, so the first one here I'm referring to uh, a paper by Goodman uh, from 1999 uh, and the goal was here to, to basically, um, you know, point the finger at what uh, the author claimed to be the p-value fallacy. And what he claimed is that if you try to use these so-called p-values um, to implement step three, uh, then this implementation, if you will, is not going to be grounded in probability theory, okay? Uh, and he actually, you know, e exemplified that with, uh, uh, with well-known uh, kind of theorems of probability theory to show that, uh, uh, you know, basically if you try implementing step three only based on, 
on, uh, on p-values, then essentially you can get it wrong for many, many different reasons, okay? Um, and uh, for those of you who are more technically uh, uh, kind of um, um, able, basically it involves using kind of Bayesian uh, theorem and strategies. Um, so that's one thing. Now, uh, a colleague of mine and myself, we have also uh, written on the topic, but where we, what we showed is that if we use p-value uh, you know, strategies to implement step three, uh, then not only it's not grounded in probability theory, but it's also not grounded either in classical logic. Um, and so, in fact, if what we maintain or claimed uh, as an idea is that if people want to maintain using p-values to implement step three, then they need to abandon uh, classical binary logic and move towards uh, fuzzy logic, uh, which is uh, basically uh, a, a logic having a, you know, a spectrum, a continuous spectrum of truth values. Um, so that's basically something quite technical, but again, that's a problem in itself, of course, in the implementation of this methodology. Um, the second problem, uh, which is uh, really fundamental, this one, is that basically a hypothesis is never tested alone. So, for example, take uh, that you want to test, for example, Newton and mechanics. But Newton and mechanics is going to be always tested uh, alongside models of the forces. So, for example, the, the prototypical model and maybe the first model of, of a force is actually Newton's law of gravitation. Um, so you could have a force model uh, or multiple ones. Then you've got the presupposition of being in an inertial frame. So that's th this is part of the um, of the theory. Um, and then a collection of entities. So what some people could call the ontology of your model um, or of your system. Uh, so what is out there and how they are going to interact via the various model forces uh, you've got in mind. So let's say then that you make this test and you observe basically disagreement between the theory and the experiment. The point is that you are not able to tell which of these four features, so the theoretical framework, Newton and mechanics, or the models of forces, or the presupposition of being in inertial frame, or the collection of entities, so uh, ontological error. Basically, you don't know which of them is a culprit in basically explaining this distinction. Maybe all of them could be wrong, maybe just one of them is wrong, you don't know. And so this is a part of a broader fundamental issue um, in, in, in basically in science, which is called the underdetermination of theory by evidence. Now this specific one that I've talked about uh, is actually uh, called the holistic underdetermination of theory by evidence. And in fact, this kind of questions and ambiguities uh, essentially permeate the entirety of the field of experimental science uh, in general. Um, and so if you are interested in this, uh, well, Matthew Booth uh, again and myself, we have written um, um, you know, a freely available um, uh, kind of short article uh, and that is accessible to, to, to the public in terms of level. Uh, which basically discusses this type of uh, undecidable uh, questions that uh, arise uh, when doing science. Um, so if you're interested, you, you may have a look at that as well. Now, um, so that's basically closing um, the issues I wanted to mention on the methodology uh, of science. Um, so now let's have a look at a sample issue in physics teaching. So this is going to illustrate the unreliable effectiveness of consensus. So the example I want to show you is this one. So here I'm going to play a, a video uh, of the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So as you see here, it's wobbling quite a lot. And uh, these people maybe try to fix it, uh, but as you see, that's not working. Um, and eventually the whole bridge uh, is going to collapse. Okay, so that's a, uh, that's a huge catastrophe and, and people obviously wanted to understand what was going on. Now, it turns out that if you look in the physics literature, so undergraduate literature and school teaching literature, you're going to find, and that's an example from study.com, uh, which provides material for 
uh, secondary school teaching and uh, and also to some extent first year uh, of university teaching and at least at the time so that was in uh, 2022 that I uh, like January 2022 that I got this particular reply from this website and uh, basically here uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse was uh, interpreted as being a, a perfect illustration of resonance and uh, and the thing here is that as you can see I'm just quickly reading here instead of being damped the Tacoma Narrows Bridge experience driven harmonic motion a driven harmonic oscillator is given energy by some external source. In the case of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, it was the wind that was adding energy to it in order to keep it oscillating. Um, so th basically that's it. Now the thing is that what, what are they actually saying? Well, they are saying that basically uh, the physics um, of, uh, um, uh, of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse is this one. So if you basically have a drive which is at high frequency, it's not going to move as a swing uh, a, a lot. But if you match somehow the input of energy with a sort of natural um, motion of the swing, so here's a swing, uh, then essentially you're going to increase the amplitude uh, as you add energy to it, okay? Uh, so there is a notion of timing. Um, so if she's too fast, then you're going to kind of, uh, when the swing is going back, if you will, you're going to push, uh, uh, to, to push forward. So it's going to kind of counterbalance. So it's going to be counterproductive. If you push too slowly, that's basically the same kind of is going to affect, uh, to, uh, to happen. So then you need to match exactly the natural frequency of the swing to come back and forth in order to give uh, only energy to it instead of uh, basically impeding it. Um, and so, essentially, the idea is that that's what happened for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The wind is providing this kind of uh, uh, oscillatory drive, uh, and then this is going to drive the uh, resonance phenomenon for the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. So that's basically the official explanation in most physics textbooks since the 1950s. And I've been taught that way, all my colleagues have been taught this, and we have taught it as well when we had the opportunity to teach mechanics, let's say in our uh, um, previous years, where, you know, when we were, um, um, you know, younger um, academics. So the thing here is that obviously engineers have actually looked at this problem as well because they care about bridge, uh, building bridges that do not collapse. And instead of physicists basically describing, okay, we, we've got it, we know what it is about, um, they actually really looked at what happened, they looked at the footage, they looked at simulations, they looked at different kind of calculations and so on. Uh, and as they say here, this is reported by uh, uh, different authors in American Journal of Physics, so that's from 1991, so you see it's not that early. Um, and so what they say is that, the, that basically in many undergraduate physics texts, the disaster is presented as an example of elementary forced resonance of a mechanical oscillator. And what they say here is that engineers, on the other hand, have studied the phenomenon over the past half century and their current understanding differs fundamentally from the viewpoint expressed in most physics texts. Okay? Now, why is this diff where is this difference? Well, what the engineers say is that basically it's a sort of, uh, it's not a sort of, what they claim is that there is a negative damping uh, phenomenon. And so what that means is that essentially you've got uh, uh, an exponential growth in the magnitude of the oscillation, the torsion oscillation of the, of the bridge, um, which is due to some kind of feedback between the bridge and the wind. Um, and this feedback is going to trigger and drive this uh, escalation in, in amplitude growing and then essentially to the collapse uh, of the bridge. And this particular behavior is entirely different from resonance, okay, entirely different. The amplitude for resonance phenomenon is actually set, uh, so it's not going to, to go really anywhere, uh, so it's actually set, it's not an instability, it's something that is set, and that you can even kind of, you know, you can get the value of, and so on. Um, so, so that's it, but uh, is this really the end of it? Um, not really, so for example, this was in 1991, 
Of course, evidence of this disagreement from engineers has actually piled up to the extent that uh, the physicist uh, and senior contributor Ethan Siegel uh, wrote in Forbes, uh, science bust the biggest myth ever about why bridges collapse. So here he was actually making the case that this is not uh, what physicists have been told um, uh, you know, uh, in, in, for, for decades, really, for 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, this is something else going on. Uh, but you see the strength that uh, basically consensus has or consensus be, um, or education uh, driven consensus actually uh, has. Um, now, is that the end of it? Uh, well, no. So for two reasons. First, uh, it is still being taught uh, heavily in, in the sciences and in, um, in, in undergraduate uh, levels and uh, in schools. Uh, for example, um, um, uh, a young um, student actually told me that she had just learned about the phenomenon of, of resonance at school. And in fact, the example they gave in class, and that was again in 2022, uh, was basically the Tacoma Norris Bridge collapse. Uh, so this is still being taught heavily so. Um, you know, this is something we may try to, to really wonder about. Uh, but now, is it really settled from a scientific standpoint? Well, maybe not necessarily. So, for example, here, this is a paper from 2015. And what these people say is that, yes, they say maybe there is this kind of uh, mechanism of self-reinforcing um, torsion, uh, basically, between of, be, owing to the coupling between the bridge motion and the wind. But what they said is that actually it's not clear at all how the whole thing starts to begin with, why there's a torsion starting, uh, uh, you know, at the start of it. So essentially, it's as if we've got a, a, a rough idea about the phenomenon occurring, and we can put a name on it, uh, but we are not sure why this happens, especially uh, for suspended bridges, because the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was a suspended bridge. And it turns out that they are more susceptible to this kind of, uh, of problems. And it, it's not clear in the field of engineering and mathematical uh, modeling why that is the case. So there is still research to be done on this. Uh, and th that's obviously great to know. Uh, right. OK, so that's for the second example. Uh, I'm probably running a little bit. Uh, I mean, it starts to run a bit long, so maybe I need to, to go a bit faster. Uh, but now I'm going to move on to a sample issue in electrodynamics. And whether this is a good uh, starting point or not, uh, this is for you to decide. But I'm going to talk first about something that appears to be entirely unrelated. And this is a so-called Barber's Paradox. So maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, the question is the following. So it's a kind of logical puzzle. And he says, well, in a village, the barber shaves only those that do not shave themselves. Uh, and the question is, who shaved the barber? Uh, so, uh, you know, you can think, you can pause the video and try to think a little bit about what, uh, what that means. Uh, but essentially, there are two options, right? Uh, I, can't, I can't imagine more than two options. Either the barber shaves himself or he doesn't shave himself. Now, the problem with it is that if he shaves himself, um, then he cannot be the barber, okay? Because the barber only shaves people who don't shave themselves. But if he doesn't shave himself then the barber does not shave all that do not shave themselves. OK, um, so basically you always reach a contradiction here. Um, and so whatever decision we make, we get something wrong. OK, we get uh, we reach uh, a contradiction. And so this kind of question, therefore, are called uh, undecidable. OK, if you if you start deciding, you reach uh, basically a dead end. Um, so. What I'm going to show is that there is a means by which electrodynamics can be we can formulate questions which have to do a little bit with, with this kind of uh, questioning of the barber's paradox. So let's see how that works. So let's do first a kind of recap um, of uh, a bit of classical electrodynamics. So here, let's say we've got two identical charges. This kind of sheet or plane I've, I've drawn corresponds, let's say, to our real world. So basically some kind of 2D here in this representation. Um, but there are two identical charge uh, particle. And then wh what, you, uh, what you know is that from um, 
the laws of Newton, uh, these particles are going to exert forces on each other. Um, and these forces are actually equal in magnitude, but they are uh, opposite in direction. Okay, so that's the, actually the law of action and reaction. Okay, so once you have that, you can also apply the famous F equal MA equation and basically find out the motion um, of the particles. All right, so uh, that's one way of picturing. So you've got this interaction at a distance, these forces at a distance, um, which are going to be represented, for example, by Coulomb's law. Um, and then you apply F equal MA, and then you see what happens. Now, in the 19th century, this particular picture posed problems for various reasons, uh, some of them philosophical, and so a different viewpoint was adopted. And this viewpoint is the following. Basically, we are going to give two different roles to the two charges we are looking at. Um, and that's the following roles. So we first say that there is one of these charges which is going to generate a field. And this field, you can imagine it really, as I've drawn here, as some kind of topographical landscape, uh, as if there were, so again, as if there were some kind of extra dimension, uh, but not a physical dimension, some kind of other space uh, where you, this kind of field actually exists, okay? Um, so here, that's this kind of topographical representation of this field that I, that I uh, represented here. Um, and this is called the electric potential. Okay, so this field is called the electric potential. And the other charge is going to play the role of a test charge. And the goal is to see, basically, this charge is going to interact or basically move along this potential, okay, along this topographical landscape, exactly like a ball would do uh, if you drop it uh, along a slope or something like that. And so the way it works in this narrative is as follows. From the position of the test charge, you actually find wh what it corresponds to along the landscape, and then you take the steepest downward path along that landscape, and that gives rise to a force in the real world, if you will. Okay, So that's one way you can, you, basically you can talk about how these forces come about uh, with this field description. So although it seems more complicated, it actually gives a, an interpretation of where the forces may come from in the first place. Uh, and in particular, it solved the problems called locality that some people were very puzzled about um, in the past and even today. So that's it. Now, of course, you could say, well, hold on a second. You've got two identical charges. Why would you give a role to one and, and another role to another one like this, like they are, two, they are identical, right? Um, and how do you do even to find the force on the other charge? Well, it turns out that actually the whole story can be flipped as well. And basically we can use uh, this law, and action, law uh, of action and reaction uh, to basically really uh, flip the whole situation around. So here you would have the leftmost particle being the charge generating field. Uh, and so you see this field that is being created. Uh, and then you've got the rightmost particle that becomes a test charge. Again, from its location, it's going to feel the gradient or the slope of this potential. And this is going to uh, basically be visible or be implemented in the real world uh, as an actual force. Okay. So that's kind of the, the picture here. But the important bit in this particular picture is the following, is that when using the field concept as source of forces on charged particle, charges only interact with the field. They do not create themselves. Okay. So you remember uh, we had a test charge and then the generating field charge. And then even when we sat, swapped uh, the situation, the one was generating, the other one was basically testing the field, if you will. Uh, and so that's something which is fundamental in the way uh, electrodynamics actually deals with the, uh, um, the motion and the generation of fields for uh, discrete uh, charges. Um, so that's really important. And you see that the sentence looks a little bit like uh, the one we've written for the barber. Uh, so, in fact, that's the starting point of, uh, the, of an argument that has been put together by Matthias Frisch, 
Uh, and the idea is to point out uh, an inconsistency in classical electrodynamics and whose nature is not too far from what we've seen with the Barber's paradox. So um, basically the point that in here I'm basically shorting a little bit uh, the making kind of really condensed the argument being made um, uh, is the following. So if charges, uh, sorry, if charged particles create fields that can only uh, be acted upon by fields they do not create themselves. So you see it's a, it's, it's self-referential in the same way that the Barber's paradox was, uh, then is energy still conserved? So now the question here is slightly different. It has to do, it invokes a concept called energy, which I've not mentioned uh, so, so far. So let's have a very, very quick look at what uh, basically our understanding of energy would look like based on what we know from electromagnetism and from um, basically Newtonian mechanics. So the thing is, that's the current expectation. You would have, you've got, let's say, an impulse force uh, on a charge, okay? This force can be electric, it can be something else. Uh, basically, you've got a force that, that is going to drive the motion of a charge. Now, the interpretation or the understanding of conservation of energy is that the work uh, that is done by that force is going to balance the change in kinetic energy or motion energy of that particle. So there is a balance between the work done by the force that drives the motion and then the uh, kinetic energy of that particle. That's basically conservation of energy. Uh, or, or uh, you know, at least at, at that particular level. So basically there is a conversion uh, or between work and, and motion. So, so that's basically the impression. And then we have that nonetheless, if this charge uh, is moving or not moving or accelerated or not accelerated, whatever the case is, we've got also a set of different equations which are telling us the kind of fields they are creating. Okay. And so here I'm going to provide an example. Um, so here I'm uh, plotting, again, this ball in purple that you see is a charge again, one charge. And what I'm going to, to implement and to show you here is a back and forth uh, uh, oscillatory motion of that charge, okay? So it's really like oscillatory, uh, oscillating a little bit. Uh, so you need to pay really attention to the video if you want to see it oscillate, but I can assure you it's oscillating. And then uh, we are going to look at the field, the electric, uh, the electric potential field it's creating, and discuss what that means. Right, so if you look closely, you might see that this is uh, oscillating back and forth, the particle, and basically that's the kind uh, of field it is creating. So one of the things you see is that there are ripples that come out, uh, basically, uh, uh, on the field and that are generated apparently by this particular accelerated motion of back and forth uh, oscillatory motion. Um, so it turns out that these are uh, essentially electromagnetic waves, or if you will, the electrostatic part of it. Okay, so these are electromagnetic waves. And in the theory of generation of electromagnetic fields, it turns out that these waves actually carry energy. Okay? And that's where we reach uh, a kind of uh, problem. So why is there a problem? Well, because the impulse force uh, on the charge that is going to uh, obey this work that balances the, um, the change in motion energy uh, only works, uh, no pun intended, if this is done by external charges. Okay, because that's what we've seen. Charges can only uh, be acted upon uh, by particles, uh, by fields, sorry, that are not created by themselves. Um, and then um, also we found as well that actually if you have a moving charge, then this is going to radiate energy away from its motion. So the charge is going to be, or at least in any case, the electromagnetic field itself is going to radiate away energy. And the question then is where does this energy come from? Uh, because there is no place in the theory to actually tell where this is coming from, okay? Because the theory does not contain self-interactions. Um, and so that's actually the, uh, the, what uh, argues uh, Matthias Frick in, in the article, and in fact there is a whole book on this as well, uh, is basically that there is a 
logical blind spot between, on the one hand, the motion of particle matter or whatever that is charged, um, and the generation, so the equations that govern the generation of fields. And uh, as far as uh, this particular author is concerned, this is something that basically is a fundamental problem in classical electrodynamics, and that boils down to essentially the problem of self-interactions. And they are not, essentially, they are not taken care of within the theory. And I'm just going here to say, for people who may be uh, actually more uh, knowable on, on these things, that actually any attempt that has been tried so far in, you know, in the history of physics, or at least in the known history of physics on this topic, to actually account for self-interactions, on the one hand, contact plenty of ad hoc terms that need to be explained and that are not really well uh, kind of explained, to be honest. So they, there's a problem, a, a ton of things have to do with ad hoc, uh, essentially terms that are just added to solve the problem. Uh, and also, they always give rise to additional issues, essentially having to do with causality. Um, so they may, they may also have to do with locality, but essentially they are locality, causality problem, and there may also be uh, some infinities that crop up in the calculations and that need to be, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, uh, thrown out the window, but kind of, in you know, random fashion, etc. So there are plenty of problems. And essentially, um, uh, Matthias Frisch uh, argues that, you know, maybe that's fine that there is these blind spots, um, but at least we need to be aware of them. And if people or physicists do not want to uh, actually have an electrodynamic theory, which has this blind spot, then they need to look for something else. Uh, at least it seems that the way it is, the way it is phrased nowadays, um, basically this coupling of motion of charges and generation of fields basically doesn't work. Um, so that's it. So that's for the third point. And so I'm going to close here. So what we've seen is that there are methodological reasons to doubt claims of settled cases uh, in science. Uh, and I've provided, for example, a claim uh, basically taught uh, for five, six, seven generations about the um, uh, collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, then there are established theories such as electrodynamics that have very serious problems which are often ignored. And as I've hinted a bit, but essentially this, is, uh, this can be discussed uh, extensively, these problems that I've mentioned, so for example, in electrodynamics, they do not vanish by embedding uh, these theories in newer ones, okay, like quantum mechanics or general relativity, uh, because they simply don't disappear. So self-interactions are still there, and they are still a huge problem uh, in these theories. Whether people get familiar with it or not, that, that shouldn't be an issue. These things remain an issue. Um, and the, the problem as well is that these theories like quantum mechanics and general relativity have their own internal issues as well. So usually it doesn't make it better uh, to, to pile up issues on top of issues and just, just you know, finger cross that uh, things actually kind of compensate each other and solve themselves on their own. Um, so, uh, so basically that's it. So are we close to the end of physics? So here I would say no, uh, not at all. And in fact, uh, I think that basically there is plenty of things to do in fundamental research uh, and to understand it as well, kind of how science works and, uh, and how it develops itself and so on and so forth. So that's it. Uh, you know, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, and, and that's it.